Uh, thanks. My, my name is James Fallows. I'm a writer for The Atlantic magazine. Uh, a few minutes ago when Nicholas McGruin and I were, were talking, he said he didn't think anybody would actually show up for this kind of conversation because who would be interested in questions of governance and who would be interested in just a modest financier who has uh, turned his attention to how the world works. I told him that actually I thought there'd be a lot of interest and so I'm really glad to see you all here. I recognize that I don't need to explain to any of you why the topics that Mr. Berggruen has dealt with are fascinating, but I am going to tell you why I personally am so much uh, ex excited to have this chance to, to have the talk. Um, last, uh, yesterday evening at the opening session of the uh, Ideas Festival, I had my two-minute uh, mini-thought of what I thought was a challenge, what was a big idea that I was inter interested in. And I was saying I thought this moment in American and world history if it resembled anything in our past, it was the previous Gilded Age, essentially the span from 1880 through the early uh, 1900s. And the interesting thing about that span is that it produced such an efflorescence, efflorescence of leaders in academia and labor and politics and civil society who found ways to respond to the chaos and dislocation of that era. I said, we're going to have to hope there'll be the same kind of response to this era of dislocation around the world. That's one of the themes we'll discuss. Another reason why I am so interested in this is I'm originally from California, as I know many people here are. California, we know, is, the, is a, a stark case of the American situation of having rich private culture, rich industries, rich uh, innovation in all sorts of realms, and a very stressed uh, public culture, finding ways to address, to, to match the great resources of the state to its public problems. And Mr. Bergeron's Institute in uh, Santa Monica, is it Santa Monica or in West LA? Where is it? Santa Monica. It, it all runs together. Has been, uh, been one of the great uh, innovators in, in that field. And if you think that around the world we have some shared problems that globalization and alienation and social media and changes in communications have created, then we need to have real talents addressed to them. And here is somebody who, after a very successful career in finance, and while that career is still going on, has decided that this would be his, his next, next focus. So with, uh, that's why I have enjoyed talking with Nicholas McGruin earlier today and look forward, forward to this. We're, you are involved in efforts in California, in Europe, around the world, in Asia, in, in North America, trying to find ways to fix what is broken with modern governance. We're going to talk about that. I'll lead some questions for a while, and then I'll involve you all uh, But before the, the end of the hour. Let me start by asking you why you are doing this. Why is it worth your while to create these institutions, to spend your time, to convene people on questions of whether governance can succeed? Well, thank you, Jim. And I feel quite um, sort of humbled to be. I didn't think anybody would show up, honestly. <laughs> he, he honestly the, said the that. Is, uh, <laughs> is a little abstract. Um, the, at least the way to, I think of it is as follows. Um, probably the biggest determinant in our lives is um, the environment we grew up in, meaning our culture. Um, besides culture, what is the second biggest determinant is probably the political environment. So if I could you ask your mic, move your microphone a little higher up your shirt. There we go. Hello? Does yes. it work? Good. OK. Um, if anybody, well, if I see a lot of people sleeping, then I'll know. <laughs> um, so the, the biggest determinant is where we were born, uh, our culture. Um, probably second biggest determinant is really the political environment, political frame. So if you've got, I mean, and you can see it in very stark ways, I mean, uh, compare East Germany to West Germany, same culture, same language, different political uh, system. North Korea, South Korea, and many other examples. So the, my feeling was that um, if I could you know, contribute and um, give energy and resources to something, why not try to give it to the um, factor that is maybe the second biggest factor in terms of um, changing our lives or making our lives better? And that's really, at the end, um, political governance. So it's not partisan. It's not trying to push one ideology versus another. It's more about within a culture, so very much adapting to the culture as opposed to fighting the culture. Within the culture, try to come up with ideas, yeah. and, uh, and ideas that are long-term systemic ideas. Yeah. So uh, there's a wonderful book that you put out. How long ago did your book come out with Nathan Gardell's? Mm. 
Six months. Six months ago. It's a book called Intelligent Governance for the 21st Century. I'm going to assume that many of you will read this book after this session, but you perhaps have not all read it yet. So for, any, for those of you who haven't, read the, the, haven't yet read, read the book, it has a fascinating combination of diagnosis and prescription for what is wrong with modern governance around the world and how it can be fixed. And would you start with the diagnosis part? What, what common problems do you, I mean, I know the answer to this because I've read your book, but many people may not. What are the common systemic problems you see across the world in strains on governing systems? Well, at least our analysis is that almost any place you look around the world um, successful or less successful, but every successful place around the world today has governance issues. So no matter how successful they've been over the last you know, 20 years or 200 years, let's say the US has been probably the most successful um, um, I don't know, country in the last 200 years, um, and you could uh, credit this to probably a combination of culture and governance, well today we can see it as, uh, as good as in theory, the platform is, we have serious issues of uh, governance in the, U in the US. We've got two um, parties that, in essence, sort of paralyze um, you know, decision making. So you start with the US, but if you look at any other environment around the world, you've got the same issue. If you, if you, got it, if you look at Europe, Europe today is truly a political problem. Um, if you've got a union which doesn't really come together. So uh, maybe I shouldn't talk after all. Um, the, um, uh, if you look at China, uh, they've been very successful economically, but polit politically, uh, socially, they face an enormous uh, crisis today. Look at countries that have been successful in the last 10 years, uh, Turkey and uh, Brazil, and you've got riots and bolts for very different reasons. But uh, even in environments where the population in general has been reasonably well served by their uh, government, you've got a, a crisis. And the difference between today and maybe 20 or 30 years ago is that 20, 30 years ago, you sort of had an answer. And the answer was uh, liberal democracy, you know, American-led. You had one big boss in the world. And today, maybe not, no longer so. It's no longer a unipolar world. The US still has a very um, important role. But for the first time, uh, this model and this country actually has competition. And um, so the, uh, what we've tried to do in the book is look at different systems of governance around the world, different challenges, and sort of say, listen, every system is being challenged today. Every system needs to really change. Change is very hard, but every one of those systems needs to adapt in a world that's much more competitive. And let's talk about different parts of your diagnosis. Most people here in here, not, although not all, are Americans. You're, you're a U.S. citizen among your other uh, citizenships. Uh, as you look at problems of U.S. governance, it's always hard to, to answer the compared to what question. You know, uh, at any given time in American history, people have always thought the government here was terrible and, and failing and about, about to collapse. We think that now, but uh, one can argue that the U.S. still does manage to address its, its main problems. How should we feel about the problems of U.S. governance now in some sort of objective way? Are they worse than they've been before, or is this uh, just a, the continuation of the long, it's always been, it's always been broken problem? Well, um, I, as you say, there are different levels of broken. Yeah. And um, I mean, every system by definition is always broken because it needs to adapt and change. Yeah. Um, and the, the system in the U.S. today is a little more extremely sort of dysfunctional than maybe historically because yeah. the, the sort of two sides, uh, there's sort of extremes in the two sides. Um, maybe, and you'll contradict me maybe on this, uh, the U.S. was led a little bit more 50 years ago by sort of elites mm -hmm. and less so today. And um, therefore, it's a little harder for the leadership to lead, you know, on both sides. Um, and therefore, I think it's a little bit more dysfunctional today. But I think what makes it more interesting is that the U.S. in the past, even if it was dysfunctional, at the end found its way, and it didn't matter if they were, you know, off for a couple of years. Yeah. Today, I think it's different because the, the the other countries around the world are not waiting for the U.S. to um, sort of get better. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it's a it's a bigger challenge within 
the country, but also a bigger challenge if you look at it uh, globally. Um, and, and yet, as you also argue, all of the world has problems, some of them worse. For example, the European governance problem now. We were talking earlier, I was saying this reminded me of the Articles of Confederation era during American history where you had essentially an unworkable model that had to either uh, blow apart or be put together in a new way. Is that a proper model for Europe's uh, governing dilemmas and where will that lead? Okay, so Europe is a complicated one and I don't <laughs> want to bore any, anybody. I'm, I'm sure you're very, very knowledgeable, uh, but you've got a, an association in essence, an economic association, and uh, they're federated um, mainly one thing, which is a currency, but they haven't um, given the uh, currency the power to finance itself. So you've never had a currency that's been successful unless you've also had a monetary union um, ever uh, in the history of, um, I don't know, last 2,000 years of, of currencies around the world. So the European experiment, if it continues the way it exists today, won't work. But it's a political problem because to federate or to give up more uh, sovereignty, more power to the center um, is very difficult for countries that have been sovereigns. The French don't like to give up sovereignty on anything. And so in a case like this, and their neighbors as well, so it's not just the French, but the French may be a bit more. Um, <laughs> and um, so giving up power is very, very hard. If they don't give up power, it won't work. And they have to do it legitimately, democratically. Up to today, it's been done in a very unlegitimate, undemocratic way. Um, probably, um, if I asked you who is the head of Europe, who are the key people in Europe who in theory are in charge, you probably wouldn't know the names. And if you ask anybody in Europe, they probably wouldn't know mm -hmm. the names. So it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And what is the prospect there? Will it muddle along in this broken way or will it come to some sort of conflict that has to be resolved one way or the other? Well, sooner or later it will have to be resolved. Um, in the US, you had a civil war, it got resolved. If you have a currency, you can finance it. It's, you have a Federal Reserve, you've got everything, but it was after a long conflict. Yeah. In Europe, on a very much smaller scale, you've had um, the same phenomenon in Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, you had a civil war, um, two different religions, different languages, but they came together and it's been very successful. So the, in Europe, muddling through, I think it's extraordinarily expensive. You can see it. The whole world is sort of able to, after the financial crisis, um, most countries have been able to sort of find a, a, a path to recovery, not Europe. <coughs> So um, muddling through, I think, is going to be very hard. Uh, that's the model so far that is incredibly painful. So I think that within the next few years, they'll federate more or break up. The elites want to federate. I think the populations are much less sure. They haven't been asked in truth. Does it work? I, I think so. And it, it, it's we will have technical assistance coming here. <laughs> Does it work? Tape. Oh, yes. Okay. Tape. The magic of tape. The, the duct tape comes to the rescue once again. I've got the Daily Wire. <laughs> okay. All right. If Great. you ever see Thanks. an airplane you that has duct yeah. tape on the outside, it's actually okay. It's, 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 an, approved, <laughs> it's an approved way to deal with uh, problems like Thank this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so i uh, ask you about one other part of the world before we start getting to prescriptions. Uh, your book and this session are talked about intelligent governance between East and West. And East here can mean also the old Eastern Bloc and the, the sort of Soviet Russian model and also the modern East Asian Japanese, Chinese, Korean uh, Federation. Are there any useful lessons, and, and to just give you a, one bit more uh, background here, as a longtime resident of both Japan and China, I often get um, exasperated by people who think everything works perfectly there, we just have to follow the Chinese model of guided um, uh, autocracy and, and things will be fine. What do, you, what do you and Nathan say are the useful lessons to be drawn from China, from the democratic countries of East Asia as we consider our Western uh, situation? Well, here's a little bit what we think, and Jim, you may disagree. <laughs> you, you, you probably have lived there. Um, and I think the enormous flaws, um, especially in China, we, we speak about China as, in this country you had the fiscal cliff, we think of China as being at the edge of a social cliff. Um, so it has huge um, social issues. But the, the few things they can do quite well is, we think, is as follows. Uh, the, gov the government at the end is um, 
really in the hands of the party. And the party is 80 million people or so, so it's not a small amount. And it's a very competitive environment. And government is a very competitive environment. In China, because there's one government and one party, you really have competition, uh, a little bit like corporate competition. Many of you are corporate executives or know the corporate world. So it's a highly competitive environment where you go up um, because you actually perform, partly because of connections, partly of because of corruption, but not only. You can't just way, work your way up strictly on corruption and connections. Uh, so you've got to be reasonably good. So it forces people who are, um, you know, if they want power, they have to actually perform. If they run something small, like a village, they'll, if they do a good job, they'll run a city, they'll run a province, a bigger province, and they'll go up. So you have um, sort of a, in theory, meritocratic um, system in terms of how to get people up. And there are lots of different ways of doing it. There's a branch of government, in, not just in China, same in Taiwan, Korea, uh, a special branch of government, which is like a human resource um, department just checks and looks at the people and evaluates them. So it's pretty rigorous. So that part I think is interesting and maybe something to learn from. Two would be that once government makes a decision, they can implement. So you can say, well, if they implement terrible things, that's terrible, true. Uh, but you know, the ability to actually get things done. And there is, with that ability uh, to get things done, they can think fairly long term. If you look at uh, China, the new Politburo is there uh, most for, for the most for 10 years. So they have a much longer perspective and uh, they don't have to get re-elected because they actually can't get re-elected. So um, the, it gives them the ability to think longer term and actually do, in theory, what's right for the country as opposed to what is right for the next election. So not saying their system is the right system and ours is not, but can we learn from some of this ability to think long term, to um, uh, think for the country, for the next generation, not just for, you know, uh, the next election. Let's turn to prescription now. How many people here have actually read this book yet before the session? So, so it, it will be a, a useful... Uh, Yes, yeah, so I hope you'll all you know, read it as, as soon as, as this is over, but it'll be worth going into some of your prescriptions. In my own view, not that of the Atlantic Magazine nor anybody else, uh, my view, the big problem for the United States is the Constitution of the United States because it is so rigid and so unchangeable and so unsuited to many realities of our times. And it's at various times in American history, there have been efforts to reform it. One of the, the most interesting ones was back in the New Deal era when Rexford Guy Tugwell, who some of you may have heard of or remember, uh, wrote his, here's what a constitution would look like if it were written for modern circumstances. You sort of go through that exercise with uh, Nathan Gardell's in your book of saying, if you were redesigning government now without the constraints of how the constitute with uh, the Second Amendment or the way the U.S. Senate is set up or anything else, how would you design government that worked now? And so, so paint us a constraint-free picture of how modern democratic government would work as you've described it in your book. Okay, well, <laughs> big question. Um, in essence, what we've tried to do as an example, but only as an example, because there is no prescription, and I do think, to your point, that any system of governance or government needs to adapt. We as human beings yeah. change and adapt, and, uh, and therefore, why shouldn't our governance? And to take a system that's, you know, like religion, I think is actually incredibly counterproductive and dangerous. And just a little parenthesis, mm -hmm. the American Constitution, as I said, this, this has been the most successful yeah. country in the world for the last 200 years. But <laughs> the Constitution is viewed so almost like a religious, right. you, know, you know, it's a doctrine. So people are very reluctant to, mm -hmm. you know, change the religion. If you look at China, on the other hand, it's quite interesting. They're in theory communists. But what does it mean? It means absolutely nothing. Yeah. They are much more flexible, and they're going to make big changes. They have to in the next 10 years. Otherwise, I don't think they'll survive. Uh, but they went from, uh, they, you know, if you ask them today, are they communists, are they capitalists, are they Confucian? They are a mixture of all of this, and uh, they are certainly non-exclusively. So they are very unideological. We tend to be very ideological. So they, in a bizarre way, they may be willing to change and they may 
come up with change more easily than we can. And, and to, to chime in there for a moment, one of the things that was always delightful in living in China is to try to explore this, this communist issue. Um, the consensus, one consensus is the only actual communist living anywhere in China now was the Cuban ambassador in Beijing. He was an actual <laughs> believer. And, and there, there, are, there are certain party papers that exist to try to match the realities of modern day China to the theories of uh, Leninism, uh, Marxism. And so you'd see articles on what Lenin would have thought of the Lamborghini dealership or things like this. And so it is, it's very flexible in the way that the rigidity of our constitution uh, denies us. Proceed. So the, what the book sort of um, proposes as an idea, as it really is, but it's just an idea, is why not, why not marrying sort of both uh, sides? On one side, um, accountable uh, democracy to more um, sort of meritocratic, um, uh, sort of longer term thinking um, <coughs> governance. And if you go back actually to the founding fathers, um, you would go to a system that almost actually was constructed in that way. Uh, you'd have two houses, uh, one elected, which would have the last word, uh, Congress, and one probably non-elected, uh, Senate, which would be more uh, people who have experience, who are there for longer terms, and who are there to suggest, and who are there to um, help the country um, you know, think and implement longer term measures as opposed to just the short term. Checked at the end by Congress, which is elected, so people have the last word, but you have really a combination between uh, um, popularly elected and really <coughs> sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, merit-based. Uh, and you have an idea for, an, an interesting idea for the executive, which would consist not of one person, but four. Well, there are some systems like this, um, and, uh, it's, and I think it depends on the culture, it depends on the size uh, of the country. But um, uh, again, this is a very small country, so I get, immediately get shut down. But uh, if you look at a, a country like, um, well, there are two. There's a small one and a big one that does it this way. China is the big one. Uh, they've got the Politburo. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the small one, you look at Switzerland. Switzerland, uh, I'm sure, or I would bet, that nobody here would know who the president of Switzerland is. It, it, does, anybody, uh, does anybody know? I certainly don't. Well, yeah. That, <laughs> uh, we, we'll stipulate that, uh, so uh, we don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> so, so we'll say that, that hardly anyone here would know, the, do you know the president of Switzerland? And I'm embarrassed to say I was just in Bern with one of the, one of the vo roving presidents, who's a wonderful woman, by the name of Doris and um, and I don't even know myself, so it's pretty bad. I, I, think, anyway. I think it's Roger Federer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I know, so, but still. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got seven in Switzerland, and, they, and basically they, they, they rotate. Yeah. And uh, it's a yearly presidency, but it's, it's basically like a little college. And it's, um, so it's a very different way of, of looking at things than, than our system. Now, I don't think this is a great system for most countries. You have got to be reasonably homogeneous. The Chinese are highly homogeneous. The Swiss are pretty homogeneous. <laughs> if you did it um, in other places, maybe it'd be harder. But even if you look at Singapore, which has been very autocratic or so, and you know Singapore well, you know, the way the government works, they try to put in um, key members for government of the uh, Chinese community, which is a majority, but also the Malay community mm -hmm. and the Indian community. So everybody is at the table and they have to cooperate as opposed to, you know, fight each other and block each other. So more um, sort of, you know, uh, an effort to build consensus as opposed to the, uh, let's say, the more traditional Western model, which is sort of win-lose, you know. The, you win and, and whoever wins drives and the other side tries to kill them at the next corner. Um, so the idea here is to, um, to sort of force consensus. I'm going to go through a couple of other aspects of your ideal system, then we're going to talk about matching it to the, the real world, and then we'll, have, we'll turn it to, to questions. Another theme that you and Nathan go into is the fact that 
if voters are ultimately going to be in control of the system, then voters need to be non-idiots. They need to be somehow, and there, there's a uh, passage I marked here, but I can't find it at the moment, essentially on the problems to democracy if you have a nation of, of, of fools. And this is something that through any democracy's history has been a recurring theme on both sides. For example, um, there, the left speaking generally in the U.S. right now thinks that this other side is underinformed about basic issues. The right feels that the other side is swamping the, the polls with uh, illegal voters of one kind or another. Tell us how to think about the issue of voter responsibility, voter capability, how that goes into modern democracy. Well, this is, as you say, a very controversial subject. Um, question is, um, yeah, today, um, at least in the West, technology allows us to um, inform and involve citizens. So, frankly, there's a big responsibility, I think, on the side of society and the state to involve and inform citizens. But frankly, if citizens have a right and should vote, they should also have a responsibility towards their society and, um, and, and learn and, and, um, and let's say know what they're going to vote on. Um, so the question is, do you sort of, and this is very controversial, and um, I actually don't advocate it because I think it's, it's an impossible idea. Uh, but um, the, um, you could say, listen, you, you, you test voters, you know, and, and you, give, you give them a, uh, a weighting. If they're, if they're knowledgeable, well, they get a better weighting than if they're not. I think that <laughs> the, I think what is more, I think what is more relevant is the opposite, is that people, before they get to a certain level of power within society, within, um, let's say, to become you know, a senator, to become somebody with a fair amount of power, they should have a minimum, maybe in terms of um, experience and knowledge. And um, uh, in the West, you can be, well, Roger Federer uh, could easily get elected just because he's popular. Uh, he's maybe very capable too, <laughs> but uh, he could get elected because he's very popular, even though he hasn't done anything in terms of governance. Um, so the question is, is that a good idea or not? Do you, do you, you, know, do you put some sort of minimums, which is the Eastern way. Mm -hmm. you, it's very hard in the East to really um, get to a higher degree of power unless you've actually done a lot. Also in the current landscape, at any given moment in American history, people have felt that the media were ill-serving public affairs. People of any decade in American history have thought the media of that decade were terrible. And we think that now, even those of us in the media, we think it's good in some ways, bad, bad in other ways. Uh, I interviewed Jill Lepore, a historian from Harvard, a while ago about a study showing that Americans knew nothing about public affairs. She said that's true, but they never have. People have always been, been under-informed about American politics. What is your sense of the relative role of the media now around the world. It, it, should we think this is any worse than normal? Is there a crisis in the media informing democracies? Well, I think maybe this is probably the most interesting time for media because of, um, because of technology. Um, the, um, and if, actually, I'm in the media business. If you're in the, if you're in the media business, I think it must be the, the toughest time because how do you respond? Um, uh, in the past, you, you, media used to be reasonably um, sort of filtered, and uh, you had a very few media voices, and, um, and uh, they had enormous power. Today, it's almost the opposite. Uh, the good news is that anybody with an idea uh, can express themselves. They have a voice. So if, you, if you've never had access, now you have access. So it's, that's a wonderful thing. On the other hand, um, it's much, much more, that voice is much, much more fragmented. Um, you've got, um, uh, you don't have sort of, res you know, neutral, um, let's say respected uh, media voices anymore. Uh, very hard to do this. Uh, you have media voices and media technologies that are all competing with each other. So they fragment the opinion and as opposed to federate the, uh, the discussion. So I would say that um, uh, it creates chaos. And um, it, it cr the good news, it creates access. Bad news, it creates chaos. If you look at um, Egypt, Tahrir S Square, well, you know, you, c you could very, very quickly get a movement going. Uh, but uh, I don't know who said this. You can't Twitter a constitution. So you can't necessarily, you can ask the questions, but you can't offer the solutions. 
and, um, and uh, media today uh, because there are fewer sort of trusted voices that are in the middle. Um, uh, I think uh, citizens, my guess, may be more confused today uh, as opposed to help by the media. Would it be fair to say analytically as opposed to with any value judgment to it, the, the perspective you're laying out in your book is fundamentally anti-democratic in this sense. Looking for protective buffers against excessive chaos in media voices of, of uninformed voters, of, of politicians who are so attentive to very short-term uh, electoral cycle realities that they, there is a market failure of democratic politics. Is that, would that be a fair thing to say? Well, the, the idea is not to take away voices. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the idea is not to take away what democracy has given, meaning uh, uh, power to express a voice and vote, but to try to um, maybe give more weighting or a chance to the voices that are maybe, um, I don't know, uh, more knowledgeable or have um, been at the business of being more knowledgeable. So the real question is not so much um, to take away, but to give a little bit more uh, power to maybe the ones that deserve it. Um, and interestingly enough, I, uh, I know there's a, a Secretary of State here. Um, I asked another <laughs> Secretary of State uh, not so long ago uh, about who, in this case, was a gentleman who um, were his media sources. And he, it's interesting, he gave two. He, um, uh, he gave BBC and Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and this is a person who's reasonably in the middle. And it's interesting <coughs> that he gave those two, because those two are state-sponsored mm -hmm. uh, media. So um, they're actually non-commercial media. So I found it quite interesting that he came up with something that Al Jazeera, I think, has changed, yeah. but uh, used to be sort of fairly in the middle. Yeah. Let's move now to the, the, uh, the actual doing aspect of your, uh, your, your, your analysis before I, I open the floor to, to questions. So we were mentioning earlier that the Constitution makes it very hard to change things within, within the American landscape. If we go along for the whole ride you have about the way we should have advisory commissions for government, we should have a non-elected Senate and things like that, in a country like the United States, practically, what can we do? If we agree entirely with your analysis, what practical steps could any Americans take to um, move governing systems in the direction you're recommending? Uh, I think it's hard. I think that the, the one thing, you can actually take the reverse you can take the, the fact that there is so much technology and so much access that you actually engage citizens through technology and you have much more deliberative um, engagement and polls and all these things so that you begin to federate the voices. You engage them, you federate them, and they, they, they could give a, a true balance uh, or counterbalance to what is um, uh, you know, normal voting normal uh, sort of uh, media inputs. Um, and with that, maybe that'll form over time sort of citizens' councils. If you have citizens' councils for certain things, maybe that'll lead to something that become more official sort of advisory uh, bodies that can help the elected side. And there's another aspect that you recommend, that you endorse, that often actually is part of, of uh, frequent American practice, which is the advisory commission escape hatch. If there's a, an issue that's too controversial, whether it's social security reform, military base closing, you name it, that you can imagine the Congress never resolving, you hive it off to some, some, uh, some blue ribbon commission. Is that something we should make more use of, do you think? I mean, the re reality, and uh, there have been lots of polls uh, made, the, the, the Congress doesn't, no offense, hopefully, uh, Congress doesn't rate so high in terms of you know, uh, trust and yeah. <laughs> popularity. Uh, the bodies that are the most respected in the U.S. are actually non-elected bodies, the Supreme Court and, um, and the Central Bank. So, um, and the military. Yeah. And the military. Uh, so you, you've got a perverse thing that in a democracy, the people who are elected are not highly respected, and the people who are not elected are respected. Doesn't make much sense, does it? <laughs> a, a, a good point. Uh, and so, one other practical aspect, how many people here have some connection to California one way or another? So, so it's, it's worth going into, 
your California-centric efforts, because there you've had very serious studies of how you know, California is, as all the Californians know, is a unique outlier liar case of governmental uh, dysfunction. The referendums in, in California have a kind of permanence that's not matched in any other state. Most of the states, the legislatures can adjust the effect of, of referenda. Tell us about your Think Long uh, project in, in California and the ways in which you think it can have, how much can the brokenness of California be fixed? Okay, so this is quite technical, but um, well, California, the, the good news, it's, well, it's one of the most successful yeah. states, continues to be uh, in America, in the world. Um, you've got, um, you know, leader in technology, leader in agriculture, leader in media, uh, but you also have one of the highest rates of unemployment in the, in, in the U.S. Uh, you've got pretty uneven um, uh, situation between opportunities, rich, poor. Um, you've got a very, very, hot, very high tax rate, probably the highest now in terms of uh, U.S. And you don't have outcomes that are so much better than a lot of other states, certainly with that level of taxes. So you wonder, you know, is it working? It seems to be working, yes, for certain industries and for some, but not, you know, enough for others. So, um, Something's wrong. So the question is, can you address it? California is interesting because the governance of California is sort of unusual. The governor cannot really make big, big changes unless he or she has two thirds majority of the houses, which is very hard to do in a system where you've got- And is a recent, know, relatively recent innovation because of initiatives, yeah. So the only way that things really get changed in California is through referendums, so direct democracy. So the, the U.S. Constitution, I think, has been amended 26 times? Somewhere in that range. Okay. <laughs> California Constitution has been amended 500 and some times. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So everything gets done through these, these uh, referendums. But the referendums are totally crazy. It's actually a bad copy of the Swiss system mm -hmm. where anybody can put something on, but they're very expensive, so money and politics very, you know, so uh, a lot of these things are special interests. Um, they get fought in a, in a, uh, with money. Um, and uh, once an initiative passes, it becomes law. So with all the unintended consequences not being really discussed um, or looked at by citizens or um, Congress. So it's a difficult situation and what we've done is we put together a bipartisan group, Republicans, Democrats, 14, um, and we've come up with long-term solutions to actually change the re referendum system itself, but also address things like taxes. We came up with a bipartisan sort of a more, um, we think, long-term tax uh, proposal. So very far-reaching proposals that we can actually put through because of referendums in California. So we'll use the <laughs> perverse yeah. uh, perversities of the system to reform the system. Yeah. And I'm going to set up a, a final question for you about California with a, with a hypothesis of my own. As I said, I'm, I'm from Ca Southern California originally, and I was able to spend a long, uh, long time there recently doing a story for The Atlantic last month about, about Governor Brown. Uh, which, which involved very much the, the reforms you're talking about. Have any of you seen the uh, SNL skit called The Californians? Is that part of anybody's? So when I, when I was going to see uh, Governor Brown in April for an interview, I was walking through San Francisco airport with my cell phone in my hand, and the other end of the phone was Jerry Brown telling me, well, you take the 580 to the 980 East. It was just, it was perfect to have the Californian giving me a, a sort of a, a riff on, on a Californian. Uh, mode. Also, there was a lot of fact checking. We had to go into that because linguistic mapping will tell you that from basically Santa Barbara southward, you say the 10, the 580, the 405. In San Francisco itself, you say just 101. And then in other parts of the state, it's kind of a gradation. When I was a kid, it was at Santa Monica Freeway, San Diego Freeway. And so we had to check this. And it turns out that Jerry Brown from San Francisco grew up not saying the but now lives in Sacra now is based in Sacramento as governor of all the state. He says he says the so that was uh, that was uh, part of it. But the, the 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 conclusion I tried to make in this this um, in this article was that the dysfun that the dysfunction of California does uh, epitomize the American situation, and it's manageable now only because somebody 
with the incredible outside a movie background of having been governor at age 36 for eight years, and then having become governor again at age 72, presumably for eight years, and having been a mayor for eight years, and, and a, a district attorney, and, and or a state's attorney, and having grown up the son of a governor, only this person knows the system well enough to hold it together and, and reduce the deficit. And without that freak of nature, which is more or less as if Bill Clinton got to come back to the White House and had been Lyndon Johnson's son. That's essentially, that, 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 that's the American model. That without that, it's very hard to see how that, so after Jerry Brown, how will the, the brokenness of California, how will this manifest itself? Do you accept my hypothesis and how, what will happen next? Well, Jerry Brown uh, is incredibly skillful. Yeah. So uh, uh, he, he passed the tax increase now granted on yeah. the rich, but it's not easy to pass a tax increase. Uh, you know, yeah. and this is a referendum, so voters pa you know, voted for more taxes, pretty rare. Um, so, but the system long term is not fixed, so it needs structural changes. I think that California will need structural changes one way or another. So if he doesn't, let's say he presents himself, which I think he will, for second term, if he doesn't make some big changes on the second term, somebody will have to do it sooner or later. So it may be an outside forces like we are, uh, or it'll have to be from within, um, which is tough because change is very, very difficult and, um, and you get attacked by both sides. Um, um, because you, frankly, uh, you know, what do you need to do? You need to uh, make the state more efficient, lower entitlements, but probably raise taxes in some ways. So both, I mean, you get attacked on both sides. So it's very hard for a governor to make those structural changes. They may have to come from the outside. And, and here's why this will be worth us watching over the years ahead, because California is a contradiction in the purest form. You have America's most successful industries and private institutions there, from Google and Apple and the, the industry in LA, biotech in San Diego, the universities, et cetera, and probably the most dysfunctional state government. One way or another, that tension can't exist forever, whether the private will go down or they'll bring the state up. And so that's, that's what we'll see. So um, with that, it's time for me to invite your questions. So who would, uh, and do we have a roving microphone, I, I believe? Or is, what, oh, actually, if you, would, if you would cue at the microphone, how about that? So whoever stampedes the microphone first can ask the first question, and then it will be in order after that. And if you would identify yourself, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, hi, um, my name is Josh. I'm a teacher with the Bezos Scholars Program that's here. Um, and I'm from the African Leadership Academy in Johannesburg, where we have uh, students from all over Africa, the next generation of African leaders. Um, my, my question relates to you made a statement earlier um, that, you know, for 20 or 30 years we had an answer, which was liberal democracy. Um, Considering um, the challenges that we face, and perhaps particularly African challenges around governance, what should we be teaching people if not liberal democracy as educators? <coughs> and how do we challenge students to think perhaps beyond liberal democracy if liberal democracy is not it? Thank you. Um, I think it's a great question. Yeah. Um, the, uh, this also as a two questions. And I don't, I don't know enough about the system here in terms of I was educated in Europe, but I mean, how much are students educated about different systems of governance, sort of, you know, <laughs> civics or, you yeah. know, ethics or things yeah. like that? So that's a real question. And, um, and, but I think it would be really good if they were, number one. Number two, I think what would also be very useful is that they be taught not just the system of the place where they grew up, but alternatives. So in China today, they just they learn about China and how great China is in the long history of great Chinese um, governance, but they don't learn much about the US. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what it is here, but my guess is probably similar. So I think there would be uh, a lot of, I mean, I would think it'd be very useful if uh, one could look at different systems not just the one one grows up in, but liberal democracy is still the best system, I think, but it just needs to adapt itself. No system lasts forever and is the best forever. Uh, yes. Uh, Stefan Edlers. Nikki, you build a great collection of art. 
and then you sold some, and you made a lot of money otherwise. I have some of your pictures. So you've been very successful. My question to you is very simple, very broad. Great ideas, uh, and using a vernacular, what makes you think that what you're going to be doing is nothing but, excusing expression, pissing into the ocean? Where do you think you're going to be successful? Okay. They, all, uh, also a very good question. Uh, and, uh, the, and it may just be that. I mean, that, you know, it, it may, the, uh, here's, here's the, if we don't try, we won't know. So, you know, it's, it's very possible that it'll just be a, a drop into the ocean. But um, <laughs> so if, we can, if we can federate enough energy and um, maybe we can, you know, ocean is the ocean. You can't change the ocean, but uh, you can maybe um, affect the quality of the water to a few different <laughs> things. So um, uh, I think the idea is really to, to try. And um, it's possible in some ways to have some influence. And if the minimum is we can build some bridges in terms of understanding between East and West in a world that, uh, as we started, every system and every country seems to be in some form of crisis, so they're focused on their own, they're not focused on the world. And some certain things you need to cooperate, things like climate and all that, you can't do it alone, you've got to cooperate. So you've got to come up with, with things that at least uh, are bridges b between different cultures and, and, and systems. Um, if at a minimum we can help there, great. If we can then within certain areas like in Europe, we're doing a lot of work to try to um, um, address some of the issues that exist there, uh, that'd be very nice. If in California we can uh, you know, push a few things so that at least to create a debate, that'll be um, or a contribution. But you're right, at the end we may, you know, Maybe I should go home, but um, <laughs> the um, the uh, but you know sometimes you have to try to give my own unbidden answer to this question because in a way it applies to journalism too. What's the point of writing about any of these things because you're probably not going to change them? If you look back a hundred years at an era of uh, sweeping reform in the United States, the people who were organizing the labor movement and the progressive movement, the women's movement and the civil rights movement and the environmental movement, they all were facing fundamentally impossible odds when they began. But, but if, they hadn't, if they hadn't tried, nothing would have happened. So that would be my, my answer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, John Debs from Palo Alto. Uh, I'm not related to Eugene V. Debs, but I did get my name from him. Uh, anyways, uh, the one thing California did right recently was the redistricting, taking away uh, the political hacks and putting in, in the public. And, and we had a lot of uh, very competitive races, you know, got rid of some people we should have gotten rid of and so on. So that, that's helped. But California has a dysfunctional Republican Party, which, you know, is not going to make it in the demographics of California going forward. So are you suggesting because of that, and in a way as a dysfunctional Democratic Party too, but they, they're <laughs> yeah. in charge. Are you suggesting that you just need to go away from that, get these public interest groups or however you phase them, and that's going to be the solution to reforming the tax systems and some of the other major problems we face as, as a state? And I'd like to pile on that question if I could. The California Republican predicament is an interesting complement to the National Republican predicament. It's worse in California because the nation is never going to be as heavily his Latino as California is. The Latinos this year will probably become the largest single ethnic group in California, about 40% versus 39 for non-Hispanic white. In the U.S. as a whole is about 17, or no, no it's, it's lo lower than that, but it, they will not have this, the same scale. But the, the, the parallel is that the, Cal the Republicans who do hold office in California, there's no statewide offices, but their districts, they're safe in. And so they have no incentive to change the system, uh, which is increasingly the case uh, for the Republicans nationwide. They're having a harder time with the presidential nomination, but they can hold the Senate in Alabama and uh, other places. So, so how, if you have a party that has separated winning a majority from having personal influence, that is, that is dysfunctional. So h how do you see the Republicans fitting into your model? Well, I think the well, Republican Party in California, I can't remember what it is, around 30%, mm -hmm. so it's low. And, um, and 
frankly, the Republican Party in California will have to reinvent itself, mm -hmm. and it will. So I have no doubt. And uh, you know, and I think there is a very simple opportunity if the Republican Party change its um, vision of immigration, since you know California is 40% Hispanics. Uh, it would change the equation in a minute because uh, Hispanics tend to be quite conservative in many ways, so they'd be actually natural for the Republican Party. So just if I was uh, a California Republican and try to rebuild my party, I would change a few things, and I think the Hispanic uh, population would be an absolute natural for, for me if I was a Republican. Um, so I would be on that side. I think that... Um, and I think they'll reform themselves. So the Republican Party will find something that w will strengthen them. Um, it won't change the issues of California one way or another, uh, because you, again, you need two thirds. Today, the Democrats are actually two thirds of both houses, very unusual. Uh, so they can do a lot of things. They're not doing that much, strangely enough. Uh, but. Um, this is a historical accident, I think. So you still need to change the system. You need to lower the two-thirds threshold, or you need to change the referendum system so that California can address sort of its, its needs and um, in a more functional way. And that, I think, is, transcends Republican-Democrat debate. It's just a governance issue. So I'll ask you a couple more questions. If anybody has one, you're, you're welcome to, to join, but I have uh, some more I'd like to, to follow up. So if members of this audience and their, their friends, if they are persuaded by your analysis of what's the challenge for America, what's the challenge for the world, what's the challenge for, for California, what would you like them to do? Um, they don't need, you're not in the same role as many sort of public interest uh, foundations where you're looking for donations from people, but what would you like people to do in their communities, in their reading, in uh, their uh, involvement in local activities? That's also a very good question. Um, I think, well, you know, to <laughs> Stefan's question, um, I think you have a choice. You can engage or not. I think. You know, if you have the time, the resources, the energy, which, you know, I think everybody here does, engage. So I would say, you know, maybe you're misguided, maybe you're not, but by engaging, you, you give to others, you learn from others, and you, 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 you improve the debate. And uh, the fact that uh, you come to the Aspen Ideas Festival means you're, you're interested in ideas and in change and in the future. So I would say you're, you're, this is a natural uh, group of people who should be engaged. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that would be, be true. And as you survey your colleagues and, and your peers, by which I mean people who have been very successful in business and finance and have international understanding, do you see many signs that these people are thinking of applying their money and their efforts as you have to questions of public life versus sailboats or versus um, environmental, strictly environmental causes or art or whatever. Is there any reason to think that your example is spreading? Well, I think that as these issues are, issues of governance are big issues and people realize it, I think that there is increasingly a group of people who are interested in, in helping. Uh, doesn't mean the other causes are not good. Maybe the sailing is good and uh, and, and frankly, supporting a very specific cause, let's say a hospital, is, a, you know, is very, very good. But in terms of changing the world we live in and the, ch the, the world for the next generation, um, um, government can do a certain amount, but I think civil society can do a lot. And um, if civil society is more engaged, um, I think it's helpful. So with that, I'm going to urge that the next thing you all do is actually um, buy and read uh, Intelligent Governance for the 21st Century, and to join me in thanking Nicholas Vergroen. Thank you. Thank you very much.